All right, uh, welcome back. So we're, um, we're, now, we're now into uh, February. Uh, next chapter in the course is on the horizon. Um, and I'll get started on that in the middle of today's lecture, chapter 14. Um, but just so that we're, so we're going to you know, uh, clear on everything in chapter 13 and what we've dealt with and how complex these problems might get, I thought we'd do just one more example. Um, and I believe all the instructors are going to cover this example as well in all the other sections. Um, so, so here it is. Um, the, the problem that we're dealing with, uh, very similar to some other example problems that you might have seen. You're going to see this a lot, the pin in the slot type, uh, type geometry. So what do we have here? We have a, um, a slot that's attached to a, uh, uh, the ceiling at location O, um, which is fixed. Um, and then inside of the slot, we have a, a cylinder C. So the whole cylinder is the entire circle right here. And pin C, I'm basically pointing to just the center of it that fits inside of the slot. And the idea is as this entire slot assembly swings from the top to the bottom, this pin C runs along the frictionless surface BD. And we give you some information about a very specific moment in time. And that particular location in time is when theta is equal to 60 degrees. Okay? So you're told the cylinder C has mass of 2 kilograms. Uh, the, the, the pin runs through the slot at that given location. Um, BD is frictionless. And you're asked to find the following. Find the force of the slot acting on the pin at C when theta is equal to 60 degrees. Okay? And we're going to say express your answer. in x, y coordinates. OK? So that's, that's the question. So basically, um, you know, do, your, do your typical analysis, which we should be all familiar with at this point. Um, you start with the free body diagram, and then you move, your, um, move through the analysis that way. First initial thoughts on what coordinate system might be appropriate. You're told to give the answer in x, y, but Seems to me like you've been given some information here, like a theta dot. Um, and, and there's another clue here. The other clue is that as this slot rotates, um, clearly there's lots of information that's happening in both r and theta. And so it appears to me this is the type of problem where you're going to first find information in r theta, then convert to xy. So that seems pretty reasonable. Let's start with the, uh, the free body diagram, though. So I'm going to put here as my point C, understanding that that's just the peg, basically, at this point um, that, I'm, that I'm zoning in on. But it's actually C um, for the whole cylinder because I have to deal with its mass. OK, so what are, what are the forces acting, acting on, on this, the peg part of the entire cylinder? Anybody? So it's, it's the vertical. I'm going to also give you that this is my yx. And, and gravity, gravity does matter in this problem because you weren't told to neglect it. So first thought should be that you do have an mg, definitely. OK. What else do you have in terms of forces acting on the cylinder? It's sitting on a surface, right? So right, right, on, the, right on the cylinder, there should also be a normal force. So there is, in fact, a normal force acting in that direction. Um, and then if you're looking for the force of the slot on that pin that's acting on the cylinder, what does that mean? That means that there should also be another normal force from the slot to the cylinder or to the pin. And that normal force should be like this. We're going to call that the force slot. Right? Oops, sorry. I'm trying that the wrong angle here. Let's do. Okay, and so why did I draw it that way? Because I recognize that if I looked at the axis of the slot, the axis of the slot is running this way, with this being my 60 degrees. So this is my 60 degrees here. And so in order for that to be a normal force, normal forces always act perpendicular to the surface. So the surface of the slot is pushing on the, the peg of the cylinder this way. This is clearly going to be a 30 degree angle if the other one is a 60. Okay? So those are the three forces that we're interested in. 
And now we can break it down into our R theta components for force and take a look at what we actually need. Okay, so it looks to me like if I do my, let's go back here actually. Let me quickly draw on here my R theta coordinates. So here's my, here's my U R vector. Here's my U R pointing from O to A. And then U theta therefore must be this one right here. This is a U theta vector. Okay, so these three are the forces. These are my unit vectors. And now I can break it down into my components this way. All the forces in the theta, m a theta. And so what are all those forces? It should be f slot. Sorry? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Of course, u theta. Great. So F slot, and I'm going to add mg co 60 in that direction. And then minus Fn co 60. And then sum of forces in the R and AR. And so in the R direction, it looks to me like it must be the, you gotta break it down, the sine components. Mg sine 60 minus Fn sine 60. Okay, so we need the following. We need AR, A theta, Still need to figure out Fn and need F slot. Okay, so we have a bunch of unknowns here. This gives you the hint that we're going to have to obviously take some derivatives and get at the kinematic equations for AR and A theta. Okay, any, any questions on that? Should be pretty straightforward, just breaking down the vectors. So let's go ahead with our AR and A theta. AR is our typical AR double dot uh, minus R theta dot squared, et cetera. Right, so this is R theta double dot. Okay, so it should be, should be like that. And then what do we have? We know that theta is 60 degrees at this particular instant in time. We also know that theta dot is 0 0.5 radians per second. And based on the diagram, and I, I guess I, there were probably some other uh, like nicely worded sentences in the, in the actual problem in the textbook, but it's basically saying that this is a constant, a constant theta dot. And it's indicated in the diagram as well, right? We're telling you that it's not going to change. And so if this is theta at that instant in time, theta dot's a constant then theta double dot is zero. So we know all three of those. Yeah. I'm just saying that it's given to you, that it's constant. I'm saying that it was written on the diagram that way, and we didn't tell you that it was a function of anything. Yeah. OK, so that's your theta, theta dot, theta double dot, and then your r. OK, so what do we do? How do we deal with R? R is obviously the, um, the distance that we're interested in from O to the pin as it runs along the surface. And it's clearly changing, and it's dependent on the theta. You've seen this type of problem before. And the one thing that is constant, however, is the distance from O to the surface. So we're going to use this point 4. And that should be pretty obvious. We're going to just basically say that R has to be that hypotenuse of a triangle with a sign using 0.4. So it's pretty clear to me that r is 0.4 divided by sine theta, right? OK, 0.4 is r sine theta. OK, and then 
that's where it gets a bit complicated because you have to take derivatives and you got to use quotient rule a couple times. So this is going to be your, you can check this at home. I won't belabor the point. Just make sure you do your derivatives and include the chain rule. That. Okay. Question. What's that? Why is my theta not 240 degrees? Does it have to be 240 degrees? Theta direction doesn't always have to start from positive x. Yeah, yeah. So why don't we why don't we say this? You can say that uh, theta is equal to zero from this direction. Then everything is fine, right? OK? So we're going to give you r dot, and then I'll even give you r double dot. So in my notes, and you should, you should definitely check this at home, there's about three lines of, uh, of algebra here. But you should do the following. r double dot is 4. So it'll look like that. And in fact, I got this because I actually converted this, the sine and the cosine. I'm going to do some rearranging just to get rid of things in the denominator. I'll give you another form of this equation. Again, you should check this. This should be a 0.4 negative cosecant theta, cotan theta, theta dot. OK? And then so from here, you can get this pretty easily. OK? I'm not going to ask you guys to worry about this too much. This is all just trigonometry and your, your typical uh, calculus to take derivatives. I want to just get back to the physics, actually, and let's plug in some numbers. Um, and then you should check that at home. OK, so now you're going to just take those equations, substitute for theta and theta dot. Yeah? Any, any questions, by the way? Are we, are we OK? Yeah? Can I read out this last line? OK. All right, here's the last line, r double dot. The derivative of this upper line, the middle line, 0.4, parenthesis, CSC theta, cosecant theta, cotan theta squared, theta dot squared, plus cosecant theta cubed, theta dot squared. OK, so I'm going to now just substitute all those. With, we're, we're basically just painting the picture of what the geometry is looking like at that particular instant in time. So all we do is we do the 0.4 over sine 60. And I'll give you this as 0.462 meter. And I'll underline that. R dot is 0.4. Cosecant 60 degrees, cotan 60, and then 0.5, so negative 0 0.133. And our double dot is 
And I'll just give you the answer here. Okay, you're basically going to sub in all of those trig functions and the point 0.5 for theta dot, and then you'll get that answer. Okay? So let's plug it back into here. Your r's, your theta dots, everything. And I'm going to give you the r, a r a theta. So this should lead to the following. A r is now going to be, you know what? Give you an extra line here. So r double dot is the 0 0.192 minus 0 0.462 theta dot squared. and then a theta. OK. All right, so let's go back to the you know, now that, now that you have all the accelerations, you can go back to the Newton's uh, second law, and we can give you your, your FR and your FN. So back to FR, right, the FR direction should give you the following. So you should get FN, if you rearrange from the previous, previous equations, Simply mg minus mar sine theta. Now that we have ar, this will lead to 19.4 newtons. And then I'll even give you f theta. So here's your f theta equation. And now we're going to rearrange everything and move f slot to one side. And so f slot is going to be equal to following. from the f theta equation. So now you have all of those, those numbers, and you should get OK. So the number pops out, and you get a negative 0.376, which actually means that you guessed wrong in its direction initially. right? And so we should redraw that diagram just to be clear what all the forces will look like. Okay, so here's the diagram, and I'm going to redraw the free body diagram on this side. Okay, so here's the new free body diagram. Okay, so my u, r, u, theta directions are still in that orientation with my 60 degrees here. Okay, and my fp, I originally had it pointing downward sort of into the ground. The minus sign in the solution tells me it actually goes the other way. So my fp actually goes this way. Oh, sorry, f slot. Okay. And because it goes that way in the, in the, neg in the negative u theta direction, the, the question was asking for, please express it in terms of x and y. So now that you have this solution, how do you express it in x, y coordinates? Very simply, you do f slot, the vector, must be equal to, and then from here, use the original x, y coordinate given to you, which is pointing in the i and the j. And so you can say must be negative 0.376. And then did I use 30 or 60 here? I did cosine 30. So I treated this like my 30. So cosine 30i and then plus 0.376 sine 30j. 
And that's your final answer after you calculate it. Oh, let's give you the numbers here. So this should be now f slot. Okay, so there's your final answer in x, y as, as requested. Any, uh, any questions on that? No? Okay, I think so other than the trigonometric stuff, which I know is, sounds like a complicated thing, I would say that type of complex math we would save for your homework assignments mostly, right? And we really focus on just the, the physics of the problem in, in things like exam problems. Saw a question up there, yeah. What's that? Okay, yeah. Okay, and I'll give you one more, I'll give you one more piece of information. So, so does anyone know which, where the direction of the final acceleration vector should be? For this, so, so which direction should the pin be accelerating in horizontally? So, so everyone is suspecting, I've seen people do that, they should, they were pointing out to me that they were suspect that it's horizontal, All right? But right now the answer that I gave you in the A theta AR, it was in R theta coordinates, so you should really check that. So the way you check that is you say check and you should say acceleration is a theta u theta plus a r u r, right? But basically, when you try to convert this to x y, u theta and u r each are in components of x y, and you can break them down into sines and cosines and add it back together, right? So you should be able to do the following. Right? So in fact, A should be like this. You're going to take the 0 0.133 and the negative 0.077. Oops. Theta, and that's ER. So this is my A theta. This is my AR, right? So you're basically taking the independent components of them in the I, and then you're doing the same in the J. Okay? Yeah. Add them together, and what you end up with is exactly the fact that all the J components cancel out, and you're left with only the I components. Okay, and that actually proves to you when you, and you can draw out the diagram and confirm for yourself that the vectors also add tip to tail in the correct way, but you basically end up with acceleration happening only in the X direction as expected. Okay. Okay, any, any final questions on chapter 13? So the, the question is, is there a purpose to checking for A? Yeah, there's always a purpose for double checking your answers, I think, right? Because you wanna make sure that you've got all the numbers right, just in case someone does a calculation and maybe they didn't get negative 0.133 and 0.077. Chances are you had a calculation error somewhere. If this didn't check out, it would tell you that you have a J component and that would basically be against what you would believe, yeah. Yeah, sure. All right, so let's, let's do the acceleration components. Let's do.
can I draw that? All right, so, um, so my UR was this way, shh, UR this way, U theta that way, A theta was negative 0.133, this way, okay, so it points in the opposite direction to U theta. And then I have here 0 0.077 for AR. So it's right here. This is my AR is 0 0.077. OK? And so you should check those numbers. My directions are now correct. And if you add these two vectors, it should be there. And clearly, it points to the left, and it's only in the i direction. So it's 0.157. Oh, 154, sorry. Good? All right. So chapter 14. OK. Yeah. Shh. Yeah, well, I, think, I think it should make sense just by understanding A theta versus AR, okay. right? So if, I mean, like, A theta and AR are clearly in in perpendicular directions to each other. It's the sum of them that gives them the overall acceleration of, of, an, of an object, right? OK? Does that make sense? Yeah. OK, so we're, we're, on to, we're on to the next section. The whole, the whole point here is we're now just going to take everything from chapter 13, right? f is equal to ma, and we're going to arm you with more and more tools to solve problems. So f, sum of forces is equal to ma, that Newton's second law, always true. Anytime you run into a problem, feel free to go back to that. But I can tell you that there are lots of problems where f is equal to ma is actually a bit harder to solve than you might think. And sometimes thinking of it in another approach, using concepts like this one, work in energy, is really, really helpful. Okay? And so we're going to dive into what exactly is the definition of work in energy. I'm sure you guys have seen this in high school already um, in various forms. And so we're just going to give you definitions, but we're going to start putting together you know, vector formulas and integrals so that you have a more, um, a more uh, physical uh, definition, like an, a precise definition of what exactly work and energy are. OK, so I'll start by the first definition. We're going to start with work first, and then we will work towards energy. So here's definition, work. Done by a force F on a particle moving 
over a small displacement dr is So here's our first definition using a dot product of two vectors. The idea is every time there's a force, okay, so that force is acting with units of newtons, every time that force acts over a distance, then work is being done by the force on the particle. And the work is given by this scalar quantity du. Okay? U meaning uh, sort of uh, the, the work unit, okay? And so the clear, the clear, the, the most important thing here is recognizing that you start with actually two things that are vectors. Dot product just means you're taking a projection of one vector onto the other. And so where does this come in? Like how do I draw a diagram of this? Let's pick my most general case. We're gonna do two dimensions. Let's say the particle is moving in a curvilinear path. So I'm gonna have a particle P right there and then at some later time, it's moved to P prime. Okay? From here to here, there's going to be like a delta R. Right? And so I'm going to just say that at any given time, there is going to be like a dr vector. Okay? Okay? And in fact, I've kind, of skipped, I've kind of skipped the step. There's dr every single instant in time. There's a little bit of dr. Right? There's dr here, dr here, right? it's because it's meant to be infinitesimal. The idea is as you're moving along this path a little bit at a time with this dr, multiple forces are acting on this particular particle. So I'll give you just one example. Maybe a force acts in this particular direction, like that. Okay? And the force and the dr actually has an angle theta between them. Right? Then we all know what the dot product um, operation is like. It's basically doing the cosine of one vector with the other. Okay, so just recall dot product and the meaning behind it. Right? It's basically take one vector's projection on the other. So that one component is parallel to the other vector. Okay? So another way to write this, du, instead of just saying f dot dr, you could write it as follows. You could just say it's f cosine theta. Okay, so you could take the, the magnitude of f, the vector, take the cosine of it so that you end up with this component right there. You end up with this component of, of f. So this is my f cosine theta. Right. So this running along dr and you multiply that by the magnitude of dr. And the magnitude of dr, you know that even in curvilinear uh, um, paths, typically what we write is a ds, right? So if you take dr in the vector form, what we basically mean is run along the curvilinear path using s as our parameter. So this is basically du magnitude of f cosine theta ds. And when, once you've made this definition using dot product, then what you do is you integrate along the entire path to answer how much work was actually done from particle as it moved from one end of the path to the other. And so you just move along, integrating the whole way. Okay? And so work along a path. From one to two, 
So here's my path. Let me say that this is my starting point, point one. And then I went all the way over here, point two. And you took ds all the way along. Basically, I'm saying that u, this is work done from one to two, must be equal to the integral of my du from one to two. So take all the little bits of work that are being done from that path, and it basically means you should integrate f dot dr from r1 to r2. Okay. Okay, so that's your that's the equation that we're going to be working with essentially for work from from 1 to 2. So I want to and make sure I got to write this down here. This is work done by f from 1 to Isn't, so the question is, are we using the right symbol here? Don't worry about the symbols. Every textbook is going to throw a different symbol at you. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with you for, for work. And then for potential energy, I'm actually going to be using V later on. Um, so I'll get to that in a second. Let's just stay consistent. I'm, I'm going to try to stay consistent with the textbook and all the other instructors here. So forget the symbol that you used in high school. Remember the concepts. The concepts don't change. But you can use whatever, whatever letter you like, OK? OK, are, are, we, are we all clear on this? So basically what this means is this force that you have inside of this integral, you got to take this force into account every, for every single force that's there. So in the last problem, notice that there was an mg, notice that there was an fn, and notice that there was an f slot, right? Every single one of those forces did work on that particular cylinder. So you have to account for all of them. So when you're asked how much work was done on the whole cylinder, you've got to basically add up all the work done by all the different forces, which means that our next job is to isolate the force that we're interested in and look at whether or not we can simplify some of these equations to look at what exactly the work is for that particular force. Okay, And I'm going to start with gravity because it's the easiest one. What else do we have here? Okay, so let me just make a couple more notes here. So uh, before I do that, a few extra notes. These are going to be useful to you. Okay, so just a reminder, integration obviously means it means area under a curve. Right? And so what curve is this under? Basically, you're moving along a path S1 to S2. So along the x-axis, think of it as you've taken the, the curvilinear path, and you've just measured the distance along the way from S1 to S2. And this y-axis of the curve that you're interested in, in integrating on, obviously, is your f cosine. It's you already taking the projection of the force in that particular direction. So this force may go up and down, and you're basically just calculating this area. That area is your work done by f cos theta. OK, so that's point number one. And then point number two, I just want to make sure I mention the units for work. What are the units for work? Joules. Great. So let's do units. Uh, so this is what, f dot dr. So obviously this is Newton times meter. And Newton times meter is nothing more than joules. So okay. 
basic stuff. Okay, and then one more note, be very careful of signs. Okay, so if you get positive work, so what does positive work mean? Basically means that the force is in the same direction as the motion of the particle. That gives you positive, but negative is also possible. So whenever it's positive, motion force in the same direction, you're basically you know, putting the work into the particle to generally accelerate it. Okay, and then negative work would be motion and force opposite direction. Okay, now the negative one is going to be useful right away because like I said, I want to cover at least gravity today. Gravity is nice and easy. So let's do, so this is now actually section 13.1. And under this heading of the, of the chapter is where we deal with work of individual forces that are of interest to us. And so the first one is weight. Right. Okay. This is, again, this is the best first example that we could use just because it's so easy to deal with mg. So here I'm going to do, say, like a path from 1 to 2 like that in 2D, okay? So say the ball is coming down a hill, for instance. Here's my particle, okay? And this particle has mass, m, so its weight is mg. And everywhere along the path, mg stays constant, right? Like that, okay? So that's great. Where is the dr vector in this? The dr vector in this is this particular direction like that, like that. Dr, that. Okay, so it looks to me like dr and mg are clearly acting in the same direction. Okay, so here's what we would do for, for this. Now you're going to see me work with this equation here and this one, f dot dr. Okay, so notation for work done by weight. I'm going to say this is a UG. Okay, so I'm going to use G, which is, you know, typically for anything related to gravity, I've been using G. So basically, what I'm saying is UG acting from point 0.1 to point 0.2 on the path is exactly my equation R1, R2, like that. And all I do there is I substitute my mg into the force vector, understanding that based on my diagram, this is clearly in the negative j direction. So this is my y and x. Looks to me this is a negative j. right? And then what does that mean? I'm going to take my dr. dr in xy coordinates, if you think about it, is basically all of my dx, dy's, et cetera. Right? So you can even add the k direction if you like. I've basically taken my whole dr, split it up into my i, j, k, and I'm going to make sure I remember my dot product in between. What does this, what does this really mean? This is, your, this is where you take your dot product formula, and you just do i's multiplied to each other, j's multiplied to each other, et cetera, basically says, great, I'm taking the mg, and I'm going to isolate only the dy component in the j, meaning for this, I'm basically saying ug 1 to 2 is negative mg dy. Did everyone get that? 
Yeah? dr is just all of the three different differentials in ijk. And this dot product forced me to only isolate the j component. All of a sudden, all the vectors are gone, leaving me with a scalar. Negative sign pops out. And dy is the differential that we're going to integrate. And what are the limits of integration? Well, the limits of integration have to agree with this dy. So instead of r1 to r2, we now have just the y1 to y2 direction. Okay. And furthermore, mg is constant. So I actually can pull this out of the integral. And I can now say integral of dy is just y. So this would be y2 minus y1. OK, so a couple of final thoughts here, because next class I'll start with this, and then we'll do some examples. I'll tell you all the other forces. But OK, if you've written all this down, here's the, here's the trick, right? For the first part where I mentioned the projection, I projected the force onto dr. Makes a lot of sense. I only took the force component, f cosine theta. Notice what happened here. I actually kept the entire force mg. The projection was happening from dr. So I took the component of dr, projected it onto mg, same exact result. Doesn't matter. It's just project projection of one vector to the other. You can choose whichever one you want. Always works. Okay? Second thing I want to point out is this negative sign and the order of the y2, y1, which is very, very important. Check it out here. mg is force going downward. In this particular case, notice that the ball is falling down the hill from 1 to 2. And my y vector is pointing up. So that means y2 is lower than y1 based on my sense of direction. So what does that mean? This minus this would be a negative number. Hence, the work done by gravity pulling this ball down the hill is actually a positive value. And that makes sense based on my sense of direction. Why? Because you can tell dr and mg are pointing in the same direction. Right? So that's this here, motion and force, same direction, positive work. Right? In other words, flip it around. If I force the ball to go uphill, y2 minus y1 would have, been, would have been positive, and it would have been negative work because gravity was working against the direction of motion. Is that all clear? So we're going to be doing a lot more of this. Basically, it's taking forces, multiplying it, and integrating it across displacements. All right, so we'll pick this up again on Wednesday.